As some of you know, I began a new adventure this summer. <laughs> Leaving the parish ministry after 20 years to come to FSU to complete my PhD in religion. And even though I've been engaged in public speaking in one form or another since I was a lawyer, it might, surprise, might not surprise you that as I prepare to teach at FSU and go through all of the orientations and that tell us about the many ways that we can get into trouble with our language in the classroom, the phrase that just kept jumping back at me as I read through this text that we just had was Jesus' astonishing query. Does this offend you? Wouldn't you have liked to have seen the expressions that prompted Jesus to stop and ask that question? Anyone who's ever engaged in public speaking probably knows that look. Sadly, we live in times when coarse, offensive language is a part of our daily life, right up to the highest office of our government. I suspect that reality is what makes many of us even more sensitive about offending, especially in a context like a university town or state capital. So the closer I get to my first class, the more I find myself recalling all of the ways we students used to attack our poor professors. I remember one class when a professor became completely flustered. He was describing a land deal that had gone bad, and he said at one point that the buyer had welched on the deal. And immediately, a student raised her hand to complain that her family had come to America from Wales, and she was offended by that expression. The professor stopped and meekly apologized, explaining that he had only intended to convey that the, the seller had been gypped out of his money, <laughs> only to get excoriated by another student who claimed to have descended from the Roma Incenti of Europe, also known as the Gypsies. I had never made the connection. Yet as challenging as that may be for a professor, it is often even more a present dilemma for every Christian living in our multicultural society today, a society that celebrates diversity and is understandably sensitive about all of the cliches and stereotypes and exclusive speech that can offend others, especially in these days when overt racism and bigotry are often on full display. We want to be sure that we're never confused with Christians who support that kind of approach to humanity. Still, we worship a Messiah who was, in the words of Simeon, destined for the falling and rising of many. He called people hypocrites. He turned over tables. He so offended people that eventually they seized and murdered him. And his parting words to us were, go and do likewise. Clearly, Jesus would have caused quite an uproar in today's social media-driven world. When I was serving as an associate pastor in my first call, our head of staff left after 20 years of service in the church. And as you can imagine, after 20 years, not everyone agreed with him. And sure enough, after he left, some of his detractors came scurrying back, loudly praising the gifts of our new interim pastor. To his credit, the new interim refused to take the bait. One day we were meeting and a couple poked their heads into the office and said to us with edgy Southern sweetness, Dr. Mays, we just want you to know how happy we are to finally hear the gospel preached from our pulpit. And Russell leaned back and said, thank you, but I got to say, you haven't heard the whole gospel. If I preached like Jesus did every Sunday, 
I doubt there would be anyone left in church. Dr. Mays was a bold exception to the many Christians today for whom there is little more mortifying than to suggest that they have offended. At one church I served, we worked with other faith communities on various issues of social justice. And one year, the issue that arose was the establishment of free health clinics in our community. And several church leaders came running up to me to say that we should pull out for that year because, after all, one of our most prominent elders happened to be the chief medical officer of the hospital, and I might offend him. Instead, I decided to approach the good doctor himself, who responded with grace and compassion, and together we were able to do a great deal of good. He remains one of my best friends and most ardent supporters. But it doesn't always work that way. I mean, why should it? In our text for today, there's certainly no apology coming from Jesus after he realizes that some have taken offense. Because the uncompromising call to discipleship throughout the Gospels is relentlessly consistent on that point. It plays like this big warning sign for any who would wade into the waters of Christian faith. Warning, Jesus' message is difficult and it tends to offend. Presbyterians, I suppose, are among the Christian denominations most concerned with offending. Now, the reasons for this are theological and social. They're positive and negative. They're grounded in our history. As long as we emphasize a strong belief that God is sovereign and our faith is a gift, we'll always be reluctant to place ourselves in a position of superiority or to claim our faith in a way that might suggest the faith of someone else is somehow less valid. I get that. But it can lead to some challenges. A colleague of mine named Ann once confided, after she had had what she called a disastrous visit with a young woman. Apparently, the young woman had come to visit Ann's church and stopped by her office later in the week to share the startling news that she was ready to become a Christian, even though she came from a prominent Jewish family in the community. She told Anne about her Jewish upbringing and how nervous she had been the first time that she came to church, but how well she had been received by the members of Anne's congregation. At that point, my friend interrupted her with this beautiful soliloquy about all of the amazing Jewish people she had known and the teachings that had impacted her life and how richly the congregation would be served by having this Jewish woman's presence among them. Finally, in frustration, the woman interrupted and to say, you don't understand. I love Jesus. I want to become a Christian. Here was someone pleading for the bread of life. And one of the great leaders of our church was more concerned with offending. Now, I don't share this to put my friend down. That could have happened to any of us pastors trying to tow that important line between hospitality and humility on the one hand and dedication to our beliefs on the other. And frankly, I agreed with everything Anne said. God is present among the Jewish people. God can and does speak to us through people of other living faiths. But why does respecting their journey require us to be apologetic or reticent about our own? All of this from a woman whose faith I deeply admire, whose courage and leadership I've seen change lives. Yet when this opportunity presented itself, she was more concerned with offending than with feeding. Feeding can take on more literal forms as well. When I was serving a church in Orlando, they put together a mission team to respond to that terrible earthquake that occurred down in Haiti not long ago. 
When our ses session gathered to discuss funding for the trip, I was humbled by the determination of the church to serve. But frankly, I was also a little surprised by some of the anxieties that were raised at the session meeting. People saying things like, you know, I don't think we should go over there because it might look like we think we're superior to them. Or doesn't that make it look like we don't realize that there are people suffering right here in Orlando? Or if we do this, it might cause some people in our church to think that outreach is more important than Bible study. And finally, a young woman in frustration broke into the conversation and said, no, just no. I mean, all of those are valid concerns, but sometimes you just go. You're called. You can't be so consumed with offending that you don't engage in serving. And they did. They heard God's call. They went. They were convicted by the stories they heard from the people of Haiti. They were inspired by our partnership with the church over there. They went. They took the offensive. It wasn't everyone's call, but it was theirs. And since then, I doubt that any of them have preached a sermon or sung a solo or led a vacation Bible school. But in that moment, they represented us all and shared the gospel. That is the Christian life. Now, I know you understand that here. Because from the moment my family and I have arrived here, we felt welcome and embraced and included. I'm sure there will be time to learn all of the ways that you don't think this place is perfect, <laughs> all of the areas that you would like to see improved around here, but you led with a simple welcome, that there's a place for us here. And I suspect we'll discover that all year long in youth activities, in worship, in music, advocating for justice, visiting in hospital rooms, in moments of quiet prayer, the saints of First Presbyterian Church are prepared to take the offensive, even at the risk, at times, of offending, witnessing to the saving death of our risen Lord. And that's good, because I don't believe we can effectively proclaim the gospel unless we do it boldly. I don't think anyone would be impacted by our faith, this faith that we claim is our salvation, our life, our breath, our bread, if we appear embarrassed or apologetic or evasive about who we are and whose we are. It is the call to discipleship, even if it risks that someone somewhere is going to be offended. You cannot take the offensive without at times offending. You cannot convince someone else that our faith is the bread of life if you're afraid to speak the truth in love. We just learned that this morning in Sunday school as we studied the, Birmingham, uh, the letter from a Birmingham jail in the words of Martin Luther King speaking to all the nice Christian people who were afraid they were being too disruptive. I totally get that our instinct is to respect the beliefs and the unique experience of others. But that's the best part. Our faith begins and ends with our sovereign Lord, who is above all and in all and through all, a mystery, a relentless pursuer of humans, a grace-filled lover of sinners like you and me. Boldly engaging in discipleship doesn't mean that we pit one human group against another. It means that we see all of humanity standing before a loving and merciful God who died for us all. Some are offended by that view because they want us to take a side, to choose who's right so that we can exclude everyone else. But the offensive we take is to serve to welcome, to love, to accept love, and to live into God's promised freedom. That is the bread of life, the bread of our ancestors, 
the bread of eternal life. Who can accept such teaching? If your answer is, God only knows, then I say, Amen.